All right, sure. You can take the lead. Okay. So today we are going to talk about transactions. Uh, this chapter seven from data intensive book and to define transactions, uh, a transaction is a set of operations which are grouped together uh, as a single unit. And they follow this rule that either all of the operations inside that transactions are executed or none of them are executed. And author talks about certain problems in data systems and how the, uh, those problems can be solved by transactions. So obviously with data systems, the data database can crash and it could be a software bug uh, in implementation or it could be a hardware crash where hard disk failure happens. Uh, there could be a net network interruption that can cause failure. Um, application can cause a crash during updation and our client can send a bad request. That is, it may request to write the data that makes no sense, violating any integrity constraints. And if several clients can update uh, at the same time, then definitely concurrency can be an issue. Then there is race condition. So all these problems uh, can be solved. Actually, it cannot be directly solved, but it simplifies the issue. Uh, transaction helps in simplifying this issue. Uh, in transaction, because we uh, give this safe guarantee that all the reads and writes are grouped together, and now uh, they can be executed as one operation. So either the transaction succeeds, that is all the read and write together, uh, and by succeeds, I mean the success is defined here by commit or fails, and in in the case of failure, everything is like aborted, all the operations, uh, and there is a rollback of applied operations. So if the transaction fails, the application can safely retry because now there are no more changes that has been made by application. Uh, so there are some high level pros and cons discussed initially and the pros are that now for application error handling becomes much simpler. And uh, by using transaction, applications need not worry about concurrency issues because database takes care of them instead uh, giving that safe guarantees. And the cons would be like performance uh, given serializability or the locks that would be taken. Um, then they, and the author talks about like how these uh, application guarantees are given and he also tells that not all application requires transaction guarantees. In fact, in some applications to achieve high performance, you can weaken your transactions. And we'll see like uh, in asset properties also how he uh, gives a, yeah, a concept where you, know, you use beacon isolation. Uh, so, he also talks about which uh, database to use, like in SQL or no SQL. Generally, like NoSQL is defined by base properties, which is actually he says that it's very loose and base doesn't really tells us anything. So we can say that NoSQL are basically not acid uh, databases. So with the new SQL database. Uh, uh, no SQL database coming into picture. Uh, there is really no transaction there. Uh, in fact, he says that transactions are opposite of scalability uh, and transaction guarantees uh, that there will be some hit on your performance. Uh, so that's something. And uh, but he also tells that there are ways to even scale uh, these transaction, but it's uh, when, tra when they talk about transaction, no SQL is like, uh, it goes a little opposite way. So does anyone have any questions or we can just go ahead with asset properties? Oh, 
Okay, so for uh, acid properties, the first one is atomicity. Here we'll discuss what is atomicity and then uh, what happens if there is no atomicity, then what will be the scenarios and what it will look like. So if the rights are grouped together into an atomic transaction and the transaction could not be completed due to any reason, it could be some bad request or process crash or network operation failure, anything, then the transaction is aborted and database discard any written values. So if atomicity isn't followed uh, and then what will happen is application doesn't know what got updated and whatnot. So while writing, uh, while retrying, uh, it has to perform, uh, it, it needs to know, right? Otherwise what will happen is uh, it will perform the same operation twice and that will lead to incorrect values. And atomicity simplifies this problem for us by aborting and rollbacks so that now whenever application will retry, it can free, freely retry because it knows there are no bad values from the previous failed transaction. For consistency, uh, uh, author says it's the more the property of application and not it's not completely up to database. For example, like the invariants that are going to be defined. Uh, uh, for example, uh, in the amount deducted from a bank account should be credited to some account. And that's, the, some, that's something that consistency needs to be maintained by application. Uh, also, if you write some bad data and if you don't have any constraints in your DB uh, or checks, then really DB cannot stop you from doing that. So that's another thing. So, and some of those can be checked, like uh, if you put like foreign key constraint or uniqueness constraint, things like that, then uh, definitely those can be checked. But it is more like on the application side. So it's a, he, the author says that consistency is really not one of the acid properties of database, but it is there. So. The third is isolation and it's, to me, I think it's one of the most important ones because generally the problems are concurrent requests and if there are concurrent requests, then isolation of two transactions becomes very important. So that if, for example, if you're getting two requests from two different users concurrently, then these two transactions should, shouldn't know about each other they should behave that if they happen serially. And if there are no isolation, then there is a problem like, for example, if two users saw two values uh, uh, reading the same cell, for example, and then both of them probably incremented our counter value. So for example, the value was 42 and both of them increased it by one. So since now there is no isolation, both will end up updating 41 to 43. Instead, the value could be 44 because first user will increment it, the value becomes 43. The next user increments it again, and the value becomes 44. But it becomes like, you know, last right wins and uh, the uh, lost update problem can occur over here. So if there is isolation, we would want transaction to execute as if they were executed serially. So what we would want user to is, okay, you go ahead and update the transaction. But actually in this uh, increment problem, right, we still cannot, I don't know how we'll solve this problem because uh, here the transactions will have to either take log and then increment like, uh, allow user to increase one value and then next user comes and then increase the value. So that is going to happen serially and that will be performance set. So I don't know if databases exactly perform, like will have the same uh, operation, like performing the values uh, operations like serially or there will be something else. So we'll have to read about that further in the chapter. Uh, the next one is durability. 
uh, this uh, property ensures that the data, whatever is committed, is never lost. And it applies to both single node system and multi node system. So in single node system, if the data is the data structure in the node and it is corrupted, then we can use our write ahead logs in order to reconstruct our uh, tree if we are using B plus tree. In multi node or uh, or replicated database, I should say, we would want our data to get replicated to majority of nodes before sending a success to client. Uh, so that that gets our durability because our data will be present on multiple machines. Any questions? Anybody want to say something? Uh, yeah, so one question here. Um, what is the difference between consistency and integrity? Like I have heard these terms database consistency and database integrity. Okay. Um, I am not very sure somebody wants to answer. Like I know, but I don't know if I'm like correct in the sense. So probably DP. Okay, so like what I know is like, uh, Generally, integrity, I've heard of integrity constraints, like a foreign key constraints. So whatever you have uh, in your table, and if it is referring to a different table, uh, some value, uh, basically some column in a different table, that becomes foreign key. And that's the integrity constraint I know. And I don't know if it, it's, I don't think so it's related to consistency, but yeah, for consistency, you need that integrity constraint, right? I'm not very sure about this answer, so. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, no problem. So in integrity, like uh, basically the rules that we define on the, tables or something like that, like you said, the foreign keys, maybe uh, non-null constraints and these sort of the consistent, yeah, consistency is satisfying this integrity constraint itself. Okay. Okay. So I can say that consist consistency is satisfying integrity constraints in database. Is that completely true? I don't know. Yeah, that would be part of consistency. Sorry, I was uh, I wasn't uh, I was away from my desk. So what's the question? Okay. Uh, how consistency and integrity are related? Are they related? No, like they are related, but how they are related and how the whole integrity will play a part in consistency? Um, is integrity uh, and how is it different from consistency? Uh, integrity means data, the correctness of the data, and uh, consistency means the availability of data. No, availability is completely different. Availability, no, consistency are completely different. No, also, I think the word consistency, like even in the book, right, it says like how it's overloaded. I think eventual consistency, all those consistent hashing, mm -hmm. I think those are very different. But in terms of acid, um, I'm trying to think how to, like, what exactly is the difference. In some ways, they are very similar, right? Uh, if you think from ACID compliance perspective. Uh, which compliance, sorry? I mean, ACID compliance, ACID properties, right? Oh, ACID properties, okay, okay. Yeah, so from this, like, we are trying to ensure that the data is, you know, format is correct or, you know, it is obeying the schema, all of that. But that seems very relatable to like data correctness, which is also part of integrity. I mean, it's a good question. I would like to check it out. Uh, don't want to throw some random idea from my end. Uh, if anyone else knows, uh, feel free to jump in. So just a quick thing on uh, on transactions and asset properties, right? Is typically that you want to make sure that 
yeah, that every step of the way the database is uh, is consistent and when you say consistent that means that it respects all constraints violations like you know uh, foreign key constraints if you have for example then you cannot be uh, you cannot have the database in an inconsistent state where you uh, have like a incorrect foreign key or something like that right so typically when you're doing transactions you may disable foreign key constraints you may add data and then you may re enable the foreign key constraint right so the the concept there from a consistency standpoint it's just that the database should be in a in a state that is like you know valid and uh, and it's like a valid state basically uh, and that there is like whatever you have whether it is uh, uh, triggers or uh, other pieces they're all like in place like you know whether whatever rules are defined right the constraints are all handled and appropriately met that's how i understand uh, consistency that is yeah aspect. that is spot on with it like i agree with everything you said but i am i was trying to think through how would how is integrity like we don't have a term integrity per se here but can consistency be you know just replaced with integrity like this for the terminology are these two things the same that's where i, I think so i think so i think the the consistency here stands for making right. sure that the database is in a consistent state but the right. consistency right. that you use in in the cap theorem or in, uh, in the eventual yeah. consistency that's a different consistency it's yeah. not these yeah. two are different right. thank you thanks yeah so it seems like if with respect to asset it's kind of same things but we can check if there's anything else we find so then author talks about replication and durability which is like um durability used to be in past when we used to write in archive tapes and now there is replication and there is a comparison like which one can be used in which uh, place and what is beneficial so the first point is if your machine dies so if you write data in some machine and if you can't access it because that machine died uh you really cannot access it so but if your data is replicated it is always available so their uh replication has a little upper hand then is correlated faults uh so for example if there is a power outage or a bug that crashes all nodes then there is no availability and you lose all in memory data so writing to disk is advantage is there and then for asynchronous replicated system uh their your rights recent rights may be lost actually because what if your leader itself becomes unavailable then the those rights which have just gone to the leader uh will not get propagated to other nodes um then there is power outage and system crash uh this um this could be due to any bug and the recent change that you made to the system may not be recovered and for bugs in storage engine and file system there could always be bugs in like you know the implementation that can cause corruptions and data on disk can become corrupted and replicas and backups they might might have been created from that data is also now corrupted so you don't know the last uh, like last correct state or when the corruption did uh, start so here like you know it doesn't matter whether because your both replica and your data is corrupted on this so uh, durability is like difficult to achieve and a study found that 30 to 80% ssds in the first four years develops a bad block so there i think replication could help and worn out ssds can start losing data uh, if they are like disconnected from par uh, so it start losing data i think within week that's what author says so the only way to get guaranteed durability is if you follow three things first you write to your disk then you also replicate and then also you take backup of like the data so that's the way to get durability uh now the author talks about single object and multi object operation single object operation is that when 
you'll have just one operation and multi-object operation is like the multiple object operations in the transaction. So uh, first one is how, like how these asset properties are going to play a part in these. So for atomicity, uh, if an error occurs like halfway through some writes, uh, the transaction should be aborted. And we all agree on that. And the writes made up to that point should be discarded. And here, uh, the, the, uh, it is showing the same thing, like uh, user one uh, writes an email here and it gets updated. Now it, the second operation that it wants to do is, you know, it wants to update the unread messages for the recipient, right? Uh, that's the uh, internal operation that needs to happen and that fails. So now what we would want here is like, you know, the email should also be removed because the our unread message is not updated here. And for isolation, if uh, one transaction uh, takes several writes, then another transaction shouldn't see either or either all of them or uh, none of those writes. Uh, but it should not happen that it sees some subset. So uh, this is the example that's been given in the book. And here you want to, uh, the user wants, uh, wants to send email to user two and he is successful and the user two is able to see those emails. But before the unread property could be updated, uh, user two is able to like read that there are basically no unread mailbox messages because it's not been updated here. So you would not want your system to be in this state. So you would also always want that uh, updates in the transaction uh, should always be like users should either see all of these updates, like both one and two together or none of these. So that user doesn't see like uh, inconsistent behavior in database. So next the use, uh, the author talks about how do we know that which transaction belongs to whom? So the way that databases do this thing is through TCP connection and uh, TCP connection to the database server basically and everything between begin and commit, uh, begin transaction and commit, uh, whatever statements are between these two things, then everything is for like the same user. And for Non-relational databases, um, there is uh, no way of grouping together uh, the operations uh, so that they are successful and may not be leaving the database in impartial state. And um, that's because I think that it's like, a key, it has like key value pair and you do not have like, a, multiple places to update. So really there are no multiple operation. You just have one JSON probably, and then you just update that JSON. So that's why like there is no grouping of operations and then there is just one operation where you want to update the information. So next is single object rights. Uh, for single object rights, the author gives example that if you want to write a JSON document, which is of size uh, 20 KB. And if you have only written 10, 10 KB of data, then if any of the failure occurs, how is it going to proceed? So for example, if there is a network connection interruption, then how this 10 KB is going to be removed from the database. And if there is a power failure uh, in the middle of overwriting the previous value, uh, do you end up with like inconsistent old and new values together? Or if there is another client uh, that reads the document while the write is in progress, will it see a partially updated value? So all these things we need to consider. So atomicity can be implemented and uh, using our lock, uh, uh, for crash recovery, like we read in chapter three, and isolation can be implemented using a lock on each object. These problems can be uh, solved. So uh, 
and single object is better in the sense that they write to one object and commit but they can't be called transactions uh, then there was multi object transactions and uh, uh, the author talks about uh, where are the places that multi object transactions are needed uh, before that does anyone have any questions around single object rights or like this uh, atomicity and isolation we talked about earlier okay so for multi object uh, transactions and why are they needed um in a relational data model uh, a row in one table uh, generally has like uh, has a foreign key referenced to a row in another table and multi object transactions allow you to ensure that these references remain valid uh, how for example if you uh, delete a course uh, for example there is a course and uh, table and there is a mapping table where students are taking those courses and if you delete that course right and then you would also want to remove those mapping right where students are taking that course so that there is no inconsistency behavior there so this when you do this operation of deletion of course you also want to uh, uh, update that student uh, course id mapping table something and this will require two operations so this becomes a transaction and you need that thing over here and this is where where multi object transactions are important second is uh, if there is a denormalized data uh, so if in denormalized data you will have duplicate data uh, that is like same value could be at different places so for this i thought of an example where you know uh, a city's name or a street name itself got updated and now you have to update like the name of the city in multiple places then uh, since you didn't had a you know denormalized uh, sorry normalized uh, data here where city could be referring to and to a table and then you could just ref, uh, update that table instead now you'll have to go in multiple places and, and like multiple places and update that uh, city name so that would be one example the third one is uh, the indexes updation so like primary indexes are directly stored in b trees but this is not true for secondary indexes and they are also considered as different database objects which needs updation so uh, we would want these secondary indexes also to be updated uh, so that will also become like two multiple operations so and then that's it for uh, multi object transactions so uh, author also talks about like all these things like all these application can be implemented without transactions but then error handling will become very complicated without auto, uh, atomicity and given uh, concurrency issues that may occur without isolation then uh, author talks about handling errors and abots so if a database is in danger of violating its guarantee of atomicity isolation or durability it would rather abandon the whole transaction entirely than allow it to remain half finished so in uh, leaderless replication if applications uh, uh, it is the application's responsibility to recover from errors because what will happen in leaderless replication is um you will send a write request and due to uh, and correct me if i'm wrong over here because this i was thinking i didn't uh, go again to the replication and check but because like there were problems in the quorum uh, which um, can cause issue uh, where you know your database write uh was just happening and the use and it was getting updated uh, to the peer nodes and the user read from the updated one so and now then that write didn't get succeeded and the whole uh, thing got uh, like rolled back 
and now user saw the value that user saw is basically was an uncommitted value so that i was thinking would be problem in leaderless replication so now it becomes application's responsibility to recover from this error is that right yeah uh, i think so because uh, like in leaderless uh, there is nothing like distributed transactions so if you are if you want to replicate to three or four nodes uh, then your data might be first updated on few nodes and while it is being updated on other nodes somebody might read the data from those few nodes and let's say if your overall operation fails and you want it to roll back now some people have already read the data which was not actually committed so because uh, they don't implement these distributed transactions because they want to be highly available so that's why uh, they like but we this cannot is interesting. Uh, so so Amishir, on that isn't it like when we use this quorum approach isn't it that we want to make sure it's written to x number of nodes before the client before it opens up for reads or you know before the client is informed that it's written successfully right no uh, the uh, the nodes will be available for read the it's only that um, for durability, we are writing to multiple nodes. So imagine that if uh, I'm writing to these multiple nodes and I don't open up my data for read, I have like blocked my nodes, then the system will become unavailable. And that's what uh, these systems want to avoid. Leaderless. Uh, sure. So but, I mean, I feel like you're right that they become unavailable. But then it's like we say, it's never a perfect solution in distributed. I I understood quorum as that. I mean, what sense does it make if you make something available, but if it's incorrect? Yeah. That, so the, that it, yes, mm -hmm. for some applications that might be okay. That uh, like if if you don't need such kind of data, which uh, which should follow the transaction properties, which can follow these weak, uh, weak transaction properties, then I think in those systems, you can have such kind of, you can use such kind of databases. And that's why you won't use such kind of databases in banking and all those uh, situations. Okay. <laughs> I can't hear. Like, is it the voice is breaking? Is it on my end or? No, no, no. Even I couldn't hear. Yeah. So I was actually saying, uh, I mean, after a write has completed, uh, generally people don't implement rollbacks in distributed system. After a write has been already reflected, so it is. No, but the question here is even in the what you said, Uday, like when you say write is completed, right? Do you say if you have a quorum with saying it has to be written on three nodes before I claim that write is completed, right? And what I'm hearing is that even if it's not finished yet, writing on three nodes, you may, and if it's written on one node, let's say, and I can open up that one node for reads and then the two other nodes fail. So I have to, you know, kind of roll back my write and the read is all corrupted. So my question, oh, my, yeah. question my understanding was that write is complete only when it's written to a quorum, like write quorum. But uh, um, it, so, so the definition of completion of writes is a uh, little confusing to me. So there is a comment. Someone has actually said this in the book with the quotation. I mean, then probably, then let's let's say if you're writing and we have a write quorum of two or three, and if the client is still reading the data, then what are we saying is, my if my system allows the eventual consistency, then I should be allowed to do that. Otherwise, there'll be a read quorum to send the consistent data to the user. Is that correct? I mean, yeah, that's what we discussed last, right? Like uh, quorum reads and quorum writes, and you decide what you want to do. Mm 
I was just thinking why the author only specified leaderless replication as a problem here. Even it could be like, uh, le- even in leader replication, will this problem be not the same? Because you know your leader will have the updated value, and your read and write will everything will happen from the leader. So if leader leader has updated the uh, uncommitted val- value, then if somebody is reading from it. then he is getting the un- uncommitted value how come it's not a problem or maybe i didn't understand it correctly this a leader i mean you find i mean uh, generally if it's leader or something like that is generally uh, rdms side you said the isolation like right? so it depends on that Once you commit that value, you won't be able to. I mean, that value won't be exposed. That is what uh, the isolation means. Is saying that the the data vis will always return the old value instead of new value. Yeah. So you will either read the old cons. Now you will only read the back. Va- you will always read a valid value. It may be uh, slightly outdated, but you will mm-hmm. always read a uh, valid value. Okay. Okay. Yeah, no so problem. I think that's where all these things, right? Like this, what you're getting to, Shreya, like the isolation levels, right? So whether you are permitting only reading the committed values, mm-hmm. uh, right? That's a read committed isolation level, or are you avoiding, or are you allowing all these dirty reads and stuff like that? I think that's what we are talking about, right? Yeah. It's kind of a property of the database. Like, what does your, like Abhishek was saying, what is it that your application can afford? and accordingly you want to uh, enable that isolation level because if you enable any strict isolation level like read committed right you yeah. have to have structures in place to ensure that kind of you know uh, uh, interaction that you don't read you know uh, uncommitted values you have to have some logic additional logic that database engine goes through right data structure maybe logs or whatever right at a high level there has to be additional logic to be taken care of to implement to ensure that isolation level so i think rdm bms is they like offer these different you know this scale of isolation levels and there are trade offs the simpler ones will may give you obsolete values but the overhead in terms of if you think like if your application can afford that kind of data then maybe performance wise it can be a little bit better because it doesn't have to go through that additional route of checks and whatever uh-huh. right? that's how i understand that it's not like there is only one right answer it's like you have an off you have a set of offerings to you and you have to understand what's your application need um, and pick that up like these are configurable basically uh, you know when we go further down there is snapshot isolation there is read committed um databases by default provide certain isolation level i believe it's read committed but uh, you can change it uh, that's the whole idea right yeah no, no but i was just thinking why specifically for read- leaderless application this is being mentioned is it like we couldn't oh, uh, apply anything over here or something yeah so i can give an example and i can answer dipri's question so that uh, about the right quorum and read quorum and how the problem will occur so i'll take a sim- simple example let's say we have three nodes and the initial value of key x was 5 right now we want to update the value to 10 so let's say up till now i have updated one node to the value 10 right and i have still not updated node 2 and 3 so my read quorum and write quorum will be satisfied by two nodes right so now someone reads the data right and he uh, read the data from node 1 and 2 both node 1 and 2 are available they will return one will return 5 one will return 10 and we said uh, it will take the latest value right so it will take the latest value which is 10 it will return that value and now in the meanwhile when i was writing the data i found out that i cannot complete it i want to roll back so now i will roll back that value 10 and i have rolled this value back but someone has to someone who was reading in between i have already returned this value 10 yeah so that's what i mean that's right 
so yeah so these are the problems uh, so in so these are like dirty reads basically dirty reads and in so uh, to your question why it has mentioned about leader less only why not leader so in uh, leader based replications uh, or if you are using this raft and all these things so what you can do is if you want to get the correct value most up to date value you have the option that always go to the leader if you want to read the most up to date value you can always go to the leader and you will always get the correct value so those kind of guarantees can be provided in leader based databases where you can just go to the leader node and be sure that the data being returned is not stale uh, but yeah so these these things are harder to do in leader less uh, systems because I'll, the more important goal here is to make the uh, database uh, available as a whole. And in multi-leader? Multi-leader could also have same problems. Uh, yeah. As leaderless. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, then, uh, Okay, we can go ahead, I think. And then uh, the author talks about, uh, gives example, basically, some uh, ORM uh, where there are no retries and user is returned errors. And I think he gives example of uh, some ORM in Django and uh, another one that I forgot the name of. And this is not a good thing because the whole idea of our transaction is you can safely retry. So they should have leveraged that concept of transaction. Uh, and then we, uh, he talks about when retry, retry isn't a good idea, basically. Like, it's not like if a transaction fail, you should retry. So if the transaction actually succeeds, but there was a network failure and the client couldn't be updated that, okay, the transaction was successful. Then what client will feel is, okay, my operation is not successful. I should retry again. He will send the request again. So here, uh, the, the whole, uh, you know, uh, transaction should not be done again. So either you have to have a application level deduplication mechanism in place in order to avoid that situation. Uh, the second is if the error is some, due to some overload, uh, then if you retry, then the problem is going to just be worse because you know you don't you're not supposed to do that because your system is already overloaded. To to avoid such uh, scenarios, you can either your limit the number of your retries or use exponential backoffs. Uh, that uh, and then the third thing is uh, if uh, like when do you want to retry is when there are some transient errors for you know it was there was a deadlock or isolation violation or some temporary network interruptions uh, but not after a permanent error like you know a constraint violation because that's a bad request a retry would be totally pointless here so that's the places where you should retry or not retry Next, the author talks about is weak isolation levels. So he says that basically in isolation, right? Uh, if two transactions don't touch the same data, they can safely be run in parallel because neither depends on the other. Uh, problem occurs when one transaction reaches the data modified by the other transaction. Uh, and these kinds of bugs are hard to find during testings and are difficult to reproduce. And that is why we need isolations. And uh, this makes our life much easier. And um, there is something called a serializable isolation. That means that if the transaction ran, uh, it ran as if it was, it was running serially. But serializable isolation has a performance cost and uh, many databases don't want to pay that price and therefore they implement something called as weak isolation that protects us uh, against some concurrency issues, but not all. So the first one that author talks about is read committed that DP was talking about right now. Uh, and it's the uh, most basic level of transaction isolation. 
uh, it gives us two guarantees. One is there will be no dirty reads, and second is there will be no dirty writes. What does no dirty read means? The no dirty read means uh, no dirty read means that when you're reading the database, you will only see the data that has been committed. And no dirty writes means when writing to a database, you will only overwrite data that has been committed. Okay, so in no dirty reads, uh, this is the example that's been given. Imagine this is a transaction and uh, user one, uh, sorry, user two tries to get the value. So initial value of X is two here and user gets the value and value is two. User one sets the value to three and again, user two tries to get the value, the value is two. Here, even if the value was set to three, the value that user two got was two because we are preventing the dirty reads here. So since X equal to three value is not committed, we would not show that value to the other user. So this is the isolation we were talking about. And then this user tries to set some other value uh, because this is the second part operation in the transaction and then commits. Now, if second user tries to get the value that then the user two will get the correct value because now after the commit, we are trying to fetch the value. So why do you want to use these uh, dirty read, uh, like uh, no dirty reads concept? So if in this case, like, right, if there are, you know, several objects that needs to be modified and uh, if, there was something like, you know, if in in some case, you know, like that email case that we were talking about where, you know, the whole two values, um, like email updation and the second one, which is uh, the unread uh, should be both be like, you know, uh, done together. Then in that case, user two would have got it, probably can just fetch it, so it's much easier. Yeah, so here when user one sends an email and user two tries to use it or try to uh, read the emails, he will not see this email because this unread operation has not happened yet. And when this unread operation happens and gets committed, then only user will be able to see uh, this uh, message and the unread value. So this problem that we were talking about here will be solved with a uh, no dirty reads concept. And if uh, a transaction aborts uh, and, uh, and any writes that has been made can be easily easily rolled back. And I think they have given an example or maybe I didn't see, but there was uh, some place. Okay, yeah, here, like this shows the example of rollback basically. So if a uh, user inserts email and updates the mailbox unread property. And if user two would have tried to you know, read over here, he would not be. And in this case, since there will be a rollback, user two hasn't seen any uh, uh, wrong updated value. So that is about no dirty reads. Any questions, anything that somebody would like to add over here? Uh, the next concept is uh, no dirty rights. That is when two transactions current, concurrently try to update the same object in a database. Uh, we don't know like which right will happen. Generally, it is the later right that overrides the earlier right. So the right wins, uh, last right wins concept. So in the later right, uh, when the uh, when the like the later right overrides the earlier right uh, and that value is uncommitted value, then that is called a dirty right. Now, how to prevent uh, this is like, we don't allow user to write on an uncommitted value. So here is the example of what happens if there is a dirty right. So there was a listing of uh, some cars in this example and Alice goes, and updates, okay, that she wants to buy this car. And Bob's also goes in the same time. Since now the buyer is set to Alice, and this is an uncommitted right, 
when Bob goes here and said buyer to Bob, this is basically a dirty right because uh, Alice was not Alice operation was not committed, and we allowed Bob to override this buyer value. And sec in second stage, they show that now there is an invoice that needs to be updated, and Bob's invoice got generated first. And uh, here, uh, Alice also got an update invoice transaction, uh, sorry, operation in her transaction, and that got updated. So now we, our buyer is Bob, but our invoice recipient is Alice. So this is a major tragedy of dirty rights. By, so like this could have been easily prevented, you know, if we would have just allowed uh, Bob, like not allowed Bob to override this uh, by avoiding dirty right. The, uh, Alice would have completed her transaction, then have committed, and then Bob would see, you know, and she, he would have gone for a different car, basically. So, by preventing dirty rights, uh, these are like, you know, some of the concurrency pro problems that you can solve. So, and, uh, you know, you will not have these bad outcomes. So, anyone so, has any? Yeah. Okay, so uh, why are we doing uh, weak isolation levels? Uh, why are we doing read isolation levels? No, weak. Uh, uh, so these two weak. are weak isolation. Okay. And why are, yeah, why are they weak? And why are we doing weak isolation levels? So uh, about strong isolations, uh, author will talk about later. But what uh, he says is basically for strong, like what would be the ideal cases? In this case, uh, Alice goes, buys, and, and then we don't allow Bob to even see anything, right? And then... Alice invoice gets generated, and then Bob's comes into the picture somewhere here in the timeline, right? So this becomes the whole serialized uh, operation, which is not a good idea, right? If you keep on, you know, uh, processing your request serially, then it would be really bad for the performance where you can actually go with the things which can be done pro uh, parallelly. Okay, okay. So to, okay. So I so, need to, to have good performance and not taking locks on the entire things, we want to provide these weak isolation levels. Yeah, we want to provide weak isolation levels. Okay, okay. So, yeah, that's it. And anything else? Or somebody wants to add to that point? I think it's kind of building motivation for why we need the other ones that are coming up, right? Okay. So uh, now uh, where the dirty, uh, this read thing will not work is, uh, and but author will, said that it will, will learn that in the future, in the com like in the coming details in the chapter. So like how to safely increment. Uh, so here like user one wants to uh, update value 40 to 43. And user two also wants to do that. Now what we have done is we have made sure that user one is not reading like the uh, 43 value, which is uncommitted value. It is 42 and it incremented the value to 43. And both have now uh, incremented the counter to 43. So basically like even if you apply this uh, concept of read committed, uh, still we couldn't solve this problem of you know incrementing. So we, he didn't give any solution, but he said that like we'll be reading in the further the chapter and I've not completed the full chapter. So I don't know about it. So uh, if we implement right committed, then like... I don't know uh, if there is any right committed thing I read. No, the no dirty right, right? That was... Is what That's the part of the read committed. Yeah, there are two scenarios, right? Yeah, okay. okay, okay. Uh, so in oh, they both are part of. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So read committed makes two guarantees that no dirty reads and no dirty writes. Okay. Yeah, and uh, for uh, no dirty um, writes, uh, I think how will it like? Forty three is not. Uh, oh yeah, I I think. Uh, his transaction was not committed, right? 
but even if it was committed you could have allowed you know the the user to update 43 i mean how it was still not able to solve this problem so actually when you are writing the second 43 it will try to check whether it was based upon an old value or a new value yeah so something so, like compare and set right you're talking about yeah the second one i mean most of the some of the arduino implemented like first one to allow and the, the second one to fail the second one has to retry again yeah mm -hmm. yeah makes sense now probably yeah, it will be something like compare and set okay uh, so i have no further slides for this because i think the discussion will go on further but yeah i uh, i read yeah implementing the committed and what happens there like how are you going to implement committed uh, committed so there uh, in implementing read committed what you want to do is uh, like um how database prevents dirty writes uh, so one way is using row level logs so when a transaction wants to modify a particular object you first acquire log on that object and then you hold that log until the transaction is either committed and, or fails and then gets aborted right and gets rolled back so only one transaction at a time can hold the log for a given object and another transaction will have to wait to write to the same object um, until the first transaction is committed or aborted um, and this locking is provided by databases in read committed mode uh, do you know what is read committed mode like do you have to enable this or something like i was yeah, thinking default, about it I'm, yeah i think in some databases by default it's enabled but it's actually a property of database like there are some configuration settings that you can go ahead and you can configure that set i don't know the exact name of the property but mm -hmm. i know there is some property where you say set this property to read committed okay okay and uh, i got confused a bit over here because like you know e e initially you uh, like Mm, author was talking about read committed as weak isolation but when he talks about implementing read committed he says about this locking mechanism and then in the bracket he says it's a strong isolation level no no so, so read committed is a uh, i think uh, the way this thing is that weak isolation levels are when you don't have like read committed so like dirty reads and dirty writes will be weak isolation levels but read committed if you go back to what you presented right um, uh -huh. i haven't read the section of uh, weak isolation levels but the point is read committed is um uh, is an isolation level which prevents those weak ones right like dirty reads and dirty writes okay those but like so, sorry uh, to interrupt but uh, <laughs> actually like after he talks about weak isolation right he says that now we we'll look at like you know several weak isolations and then he talks about read committed so that's the reason i have to check here yeah, how he's saying yeah. it but mm -hmm. uh, if, if somebody else who read it yeah can we were all relying on you <laughs> <laughs> and here i am i have actually got confused probably yeah you dp whenever you read or somebody else read yeah, you can yeah, just sure. yeah we can just yeah. uh, point this thing again yeah uh, yeah so uh, and the, then uh, how do we prevent like dirty reads so like that one option that would be yeah using the same lock that uh, so uh, here what will happen is uh, Uh, to require any transaction that wants to read an object you will take acquire the lock and then release it after reading and and this will ensure that a read couldn't happen while there was uh, a uncommitted value in the place because there during that time the lock would be held by a transaction that was making a write but uh, this approach uh, where you know uh, requiring where you need a uh, read logs does not work well because if there is a transaction which is performing right and the transaction is really huge 
it's a long running transaction then your read will have to wait unnecessarily uh, although it's just a read operation could have been done so this harms the response time of our application and which is which is bad uh, and for that reason uh, uh, most database prevents dirty reads using uh, the, this approach um, this approach, yeah. Uh, yeah, this so approach. Sorry, this approach. <laughs> the wrong diagram. Yeah, one thing that I read was that so, like in this case, user one wants to set x and y, right? So first, he has to acquire log for x and y, and so in the meanwhile, if user two wants to do something, he cannot access X and Y because they are locked by user one until it gets committed when the lock will be released. Mm -hmm. So now yeah. the problem you have mentioned is that, so now if you're taking locks, then the read are also blocked. If your lock also blocks read. So one thing you can do is that uh, when you are in the process of the updating the value, you expose the previous value. So when you were taking lock, on X and Y, you have made the previous value of X and Y accessible. So that while you were modifying it, uh, someone can read that previous value that was there for X and Y. And once these new values are committed, then they will see the new values. Yeah, it's more like keeping sort of two versions, right? Two, two versions. versions. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, and it's yeah, it's uh, I read it in the book. Yeah, it says that it keeps both her old value and the new value. So when the user reads it, it gives the old value, and for write it's the new value. So when it's committed, then the the old value is now re removed. Yeah. yeah, I was actually thinking how they would be maintaining it in actually like the structure, in the data structure, how they would be keeping both old and new value. Would they be like you keeping it forever or like after the commit, they would be removing the old value? Or... Yeah, I think after the commit, the old is just like for the period of that, you know, to handle that situation when a user request before it's committed, right? Some value. Mm -hmm. So it's not kept forever. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Another uh, thing that I was, sorry, yeah, go ahead. No, yeah, I was saying, uh, and it depends on the like, database uh, database for functionality do you want so some databases they might keep the values uh, to give you that version control access that let's say if my requirement as a user is that i want to see what was uh, how did my database look at that at some particular time back in history right then if i have those versions maintained then i can uh, I can pick the values that are for that date and that version, and I can return that history of data. So, like, yeah, in in that some situation, those histories are important, and that's why you might keep the values. No, that makes sense. But the way I see those versions in those databases is that version information itself becomes data, right? Mm, yeah, yeah. Just to mention, it's not in the context of these transactions and isolation. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The versions by themselves are serving as data. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Yeah. So there, the version itself is your piece of data that will define what you yeah. can access. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing I was thinking was, why do we take like a uh, complete row level logs? Why can't we just take cell level log? For example, if I have to update uh, age equal to twenty five, where name is equal to some x. Right, so I'm just updating that one cell, right? But the log will be taken on the entire row, and why is that? I think, I think it goes back to how your, uh, like in RDBMSs, right? We usually traditionally we have been having this row-oriented disk structures, right? So you fetch like, you know, it's like row level. You have unique constraint, right? If you modify something in. Uh, I mean, how to say it. so your your integrity or your en entity is a row level, right? When you're looking at row oriented databases, I believe that might be the case. Um, but uh, but these questions make me think like how we are 
um, trying to do. Yeah, that. yeah. I mean, yeah, makes sense. So, uh, so I think what we're saying is that in transaction-based systems, we are leading the rows, right? So let's say if we are not taking that row level lock, then we can read uh, the value. No, I was no, thinking, then we can yeah. read the yeah. row, which is not completely updated. Is that the problem? Yeah, no, I, I mean, at, as an entity, right? I think in row-oriented data structures, you're looking, uh, table is a high level entity, right? But you can split the table into like these row entities, right? Which can be independently updated because each of them is uniquely identified by a primary key or something. Um, but um, on the same side, now we also have these column oriented stores, right? Where you can have a cell based thing. So um, again, it's something for me to go back and check. It's, it's a good question. Um, I don't know if, if things have evolved over time and if we can have column level locks, but I don't remember hearing that, but why not? That's the question, right? Yeah, although read level lock, uh, sorry, row level lock will be uh, faster, right, than column because row has lesser data than column. What do you mean row has lesser data? So one row will have less amount of data than one column. Oh, you were saying like the whole column of that, yeah. Now, if you're taking lock and uh, entire column, it will have lots of data. No, no, I think what possibly, Shreya, correct me if I'm wrong, Shreya, I interpreted your question as like cell level lock or something. Yeah, yeah, it's cell yeah. level. Yeah, it's not column level. So it could be, I mean, uh, some OS limitation to have the number of locks. To have number of locks on what? So, I know, yeah. Like, I'm there thinking are page, about there are page level logs, which is OS thing, yeah. Like, I, so, so what I'm thinking here that I mean, uh, that how they actually uh, lock that data. So they have to uh, use some synchronization object. If you think from the programming point of view, right. So how many number of actual synchronization object you can create? Uh, yeah, that's a good point about synchronization objects. I am not sure if there is a limit on the number. But definitely, there has to be something done to do with the coordination of these, you know, locks and all of that. Like you will suddenly bloat the number of locks you have, right? With field. Right. But uh, I'm still very curious about going back and checking it. So uh, one reason I could think of is that, uh, like, uh, so a row is a unique identity. Like each row could be uniquely identified, so that you can say uh, that you are applying a lock on this piece of data. If you are applying lock on cell, uh, like a cell might not have a unique identity because, so let's say yeah. Yeah, if yeah. you are applying lock on, uh, on that cell, which is age, it does not have any unique identity. So Who that might be a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. So, what is the difference between cell and column? I didn't understand. So, so, mm -hmm. Go ahead, yeah. Column is about that if you have 100 rows in your database and I pick the age column, then it's like lock over all the 100 uh, values of those 100 rows, right? But just for the age column. But cell level is just one value. Right. Column is like a whole column spread across multiple rows. Right. Yeah, but the internal data structure is also, uh, I mean, here in RDMS, it is stored like a row, right? No, no, that is true. That is where we were thinking that in R. So first of all, it won't be the right statement to make in today's times that RDBMS is our row oriented because column store is a big one now. Even if you look at SQL Server, they store their data in a column store fashion, uh, analytical databases. Um, so they are no more restricted to row based. Um, but um, having said that, uh, I mean, one of the reasons might be if we if we stick to the row um, criteria, right, row based databases, then and if you put a lock on the cell, then how do you attribute it to like which row it belongs and all of that things. 
but I don't know how to. I'm thinking how to map it to the general you know, RDB method. Maybe th these would be the good points to take up, start from for the next time. So one question we talked about was uh, these cell level locks. Mm -hmm. Was there another? Yeah, there was another like uh, where I got confused between weak isolation and strong isolation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. So I just took a note of these. Um, but this was great. So it, it's um, so is that all? Should I stop recording? Yeah, could you repeat the question uh, regarding that the weak and strong isolation? So uh, the question was like, the author says in weak isolation levels, he specifies read committed, right? And right. then we, and he explains like how to implement read committed. He talks about logs, uh, like uh, how logs can be used to implement read committed. And in the parenthesis, he says uh, strong isolation levels. So the question was, is read committed a weak isolation weak. level? Strong yeah. isolation. Or strong or isolation level. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, so I think my understanding is that to implement read uh, committed, you can use logs. But if you're using logs, then it will give you strong isolation. So then I think probably you will talk about something which will also, so with I mean, with strong isolation and with uh, logs, the problem is that your performance will get a hit. And that's where you wanted to do weak isolation levels so that your database is performant in when you are doing some concurrent reads and writes. But, right? but I think the question goes back to Abhishek that what you are saying is an implementation scenario that if you use logs, your performance goes down and all of that. But then you can avoid all this by the I have on screen. Yeah, we should, somewhere in the book, author clearly mentioned that transaction means performance hit. Yeah, yeah. right. Well, no, I'm yeah. asking that at a, at a conceptual level, right? Is there a difference between when I say read committed, right? Without going into whether it's logs or whatever. Is there, is there a difference? Like I'm getting confused about, this was long time back I read about all these things. So it's not on the top of my head, but... Mm -hmm. Is it a weak isolation level? Is is there something like can I can I quote read committed as a weak isolation level versus strong, just by the you know the conceptual definition of it without going into it? Further in the book, um, further in the book, author says like there are three levels of isolations. Mm -hmm. Each one is stronger than the previous one. It goes like this: the first one is read committed where you will be guaranteed that whenever you read a record from the database, you're always getting a, a value which is already committed by a transaction. Yeah. And something which is little stronger than weak isolation is uh, uh, dead snapshot isolation. Yeah. Means uh, if you're going to have long running read, read only queries and uh, a, run, a long running read only transaction started and before it ended, multiple transactions have updated values and they committed. And this transaction should not, even though it is reading after another commit had updated, this long running read only transaction should only read values which were at the point in time when the transaction has actually started. Right, right. So, so um, what is that one like? Snapshot isolation is stronger than read only commit, uh, read commit. Uh, isolation in that regard and okay. the ultimate isolation which everyone wants to get to but which is very hard to get to in terms of performance is uh, serializability basically yeah yeah and it's like you would like to serialize all the transactions and start a transaction commit it only after that go for next transaction started and commit it like sequential. Yeah, yeah. sequential Serializability is the one which everyone wants to get to, but they cannot because of performance issues. Only one database does that, I think, at least as per him, that is uh, um, VoltDB. Which one? Volt, VOLT, VoltDB. Volt. I just read it yesterday, so I may be wrong, but yeah, that's what I remember. Even what you said, uh, I don't know, was Chaitanya or so, was it Chaitanya? Yes. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I think what you're saying is like the, the relative, like the ordering, right? Read is the weakest, read committed is the weakest, and then it's 
progresses right snapshot is stronger and so on um, yes so that's that's good to know um, but if we just want to you know i think some of us had read the chapter anybody who wants to you know go back um, so we did get some leads but thanks for sharing this uh, i think it gives some idea but it it really baffles me about after shira mentioned since i didn't go over the you know like why i'm i'm a bit hung up on this like why did he put it on the isolation level maybe he, uh, author just meant to say this ordering right like read committed is the weakest of the three yeah yeah it's not like that actually well definitely right. read committed is the weakest of the three and right. serializability is the strongest of all of them right right that makes sense um all right so let me stop recording and uh...